Hello. Welcome to my show. It's KubeCon week. Last week was DockerCon week. We're just cramming all the container stuff possible into one month. So hope you're checking it out, uh, watching the keynotes for free. If you don't want to attend virtually, maybe you're there and you're here. And then I would ask, why are you watching? It's like after hours are probably having the party now. Um, and KubeCon EU. Uh, by the way, any of you who have been to a KubeCon, raise your hand, give me a thumbs up. And I, I plan on being, you know, depending on the pandemic, I plan on being in Detroit for KubeCon North America. So if you're in North America or in that area and you plan on attending that, uh, let me know in chat. That's obviously, I don't know, what, five months away or something like that. But um, got a plan now, and I'm hoping to be there. I haven't bought my tickets yet, but 
I'm about to. So hopefully you see you at a conference. DockerCon didn't really, they had like a quasi in real world thing in San Francisco. I didn't get an invite, even though I was a speaker. So I assume that it was really just for a private audience, not the entire world invited. But hopefully next year, maybe next year, we'll be back to Docker Cons again in the real world because a lot of my friends I met at KubeCon and DockerCon and um, other conferences. In fact, I, I, I feel like I get much more connected in this community when I go to physical conferences. So if you don't have physical conferences in your area, go to a meetup if they're having those or get involved with the local community. Usually there's a Slack or a virtual meetup or something, especially cloud native meetups or Docker meetups, because to me, that has made all the difference. I now know I can find people to help me easier. I have a community that will listen to me rant around the latest container vulnerability <laughs> or whatever it might be. And so obviously we have all these online communities, devops.fan, Discord server right there for all DevOps people. Um, but, you know, having people in your local community is great. And I bet you they're there. You just got to find them online and then go meet them in the real world. All right. I have a bunch of things I want to talk about, but this week is all about Q&A. So it's chat first, like usual, but more focused on anything you want to talk about in the world of containers and DevOps and cloud computing. Um, bring up the questions and I'll I'll get to them first. And then I have other things I want to share. I realized some stuff has happened lately, news. I don't normally cover news because there's so many ways for you to get that news. And um, I thought I would share some things, but let me just see who's here. Um, thanks for taking my course. I appreciate it. Um, after learning DevOps tools, if I have done five projects, how many years of experience I can project? I'm not really sure I understand that question. Um, again, DevOps tools are just part of your journey. Really, it's about understanding the fundamentals of DevOps, which aren't tools. Tools are a way to implement DevOps. So hopefully if you're, if you don't have a job experience in DevOps, then you hopefully have had some experience as a sysadmin or as a developer. You kind of need one of those first because DevOps itself is kind of sitting in the middle between those two. And there's lots of different jobs. Some jobs are very sysadmin and ops focused in the DevOps world. Some are more developer focused. And there's other jobs related to DevOps that aren't either one of those. Um, but the typical paths are to be a developer or an operator and then move your way into a DevOps role. That's typically what happens. It's hard. I think it's gonna be very hard for someone to go from nothing in tech to a DevOps role just because it you don't normally see people with their first job in tech being a DevOps role. And I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. Ashish, sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, so on that one, I'm not really sure. Give me a, a more accurate question and I'll, I'll look for it in chat, see if I can't. Um, better understand what you're asking for. Um, are you saying you have, you've done some projects, but they're none for an employer? Well, then you to make up your lack of experience. You've got to go get certifications. So you definitely, at first you need to read books, right? So reading the DevOps handbook, my number one recommendation for any DevOps professional, DevOps handbook, second edition just came out. I'm currently listening to it on audiobook. I had the old one, getting the new one just because I want to hear the new case studies and information that they've updated in the book. And then there's follow-on books from that, uh, Accelerate. Um, there's a bunch of other ones by Gene Kim. And then I look uh, look at the O'Reilly books or the Manning books around distributed computing, cloud-native computing, and read up on some of those because the DevOps handbook doesn't necessarily go into infrastructure and architecture like those books do. So once you've got those books down, you got to go after DevOps and cloud certifications. I usually recommend at least one Linux certification, one cloud certification. And then if you want to go for something like Kubernetes or get more specific into a cloud, you, the, the, certain clouds have cloud DevOps certifications. So do those. And, all, and I also would advocate for a security certification like Security Plus, which is probably the most basic. There are cloud-specific security certifications. There's a Kubernetes security certification, but you don't need all those 
tool specific ones, just something like Security Plus and a networking certification like Networking Plus. You need to know networking. You have to know security basics. These are all fundamental things that DevOps engineers are responsible for typically. You can't make the, the infrastructure less secure. You'll get in trouble for that. So you have to understand a lot of that stuff. Um, hopefully that helps. Hello, Martin. Hello, everyone. Um, let's see. For the auth in and auth z stuff, I would be fine with getting links to how you implement that stuff yourself. Haven't found that. Um, yeah, auth in, auth z. I don't implement that myself. In fact, my once I I have a team. If if they're on Swarm and they are using Portainer and they need some advanced features like more advanced authentication mechanisms that Portainer doesn't provide, it's time to leave Swarm because a lot of the industry third party tools stop supporting Swarm a few years ago, even though we're there's news that we're going to get a Swarm update maybe this year. We There's been some action in the pull request for CSI support. So that's better volume support inside of Docker and Swarm. So technically Swarm would be getting new features whenever Docker has a new major release. But I think a lot of the industry has given up on Swarm. So if it works for you, still great, right? It still has the same functionality it had before. But the off stuff and some of the other third-party stuff like networking and um, what else? And storage and third-party monitoring tools and all that, they have sort of moved on to Kubernetes because that's where the money's at. In fact, if I go to Mirantis and look at their blog, you'll see they did a post recently. This is really interesting, I think. Speaking of Swarm, in April, Mirantis, and if you didn't know, Mirantis was the company that bought most of Docker back in 2019. They they bought all the pro the private or um, intellectual property for their paid tools, their non open source tools, their private tools, private code. So those closed source tools were things like Docker Enterprise. There was some other bits, but everything else stayed with Docker. All the open source source stayed with Docker, Docker Desktop stayed with Docker, Docker Hub, all those things, right? Compose. So Mirantis, when they did that, technically Swarm is still SwarmKit. It's open source. It's a part of the Docker engine, which is open source. But Mirantis took over the enterprise product, which is where they at the time had 700 plus enterprise customers paying for Swarm support. So Mirantis brought on those customers. And in this post from just last month, they talked about actually that they have more than 100 customers still on Swarm, including very large companies, multinational companies, with 1,000 clusters, 10,000 nodes, running 100,000 containers on Swarm. So they and there's all these specific things like FIPS, which is important in certain government and financial regulation kind of places. You need FIPS compliant SSL and all that stuff. Um, and they talk about other things there like RBAC. But those are all a part of their paid product. So if you were someone who believed you wanted to use Swarm for some things and maybe Kubernetes in the future or Kubernetes for more advanced things, Mirantis's enterprise Kubernetes distribution that includes Swarm might be, uh, might be something you should consider. But great question. Uh, Neil's hope, hoping to go to KubeCon NA. Me too. <laughs> uh, I... I have not attended a KubeCon in in any fashion, you know, other than just watching virtual videos since the pandemic. So I'm I'm excited to get back to real world conferences. PayCon, you mean PyCon, Marco? Um, I have not attended PyCon, and I'm not really a Python developer. So I'm a DevOps engineer for dev developers that use Python, <laughs> but I don't really go to PyCon because I, I don't regularly code in Python. Um, but thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. You're, yeah, you were hyping on Docker Swarm CSI support. Yeah. So th the sad thing is I don't know what Docker's... I haven't gotten a, a stance from like, when's Docker's next major release? I'll probably ask for that. Um, next time I'm chatting with the captain's community, I'll, I'll see if I can't get an estimate. Are we looking at 
a major Docker release this year that would possibly include CSI support. But we also, what I also don't know yet is if CSI would just work with Docker. Like, wouldn't that be interesting if I could just use Docker with remote storage? Because Docker has its own plugging system, including storage drivers, but most of the industry is now just worried about supporting CSI, the, the plugin system for storage in Kubernetes, and Docker is trying to adopt that. Now, what I hear is that the drivers themselves will need updates in order to support Docker. So that means that each, you know, it doesn't mean that every CSI driver automatically works because those CSI drivers were largely built, even though it's supposed to be this middle shim, um, those drivers were all just designed to support Kubernetes. They weren't designed to support anything else. So I hear that there's still going to be work to do on the, on the vendor side from each one of their, their storage provider plugins. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see. What DevOps workflow would you recommend for developers wanting to build SaaS? Um, I don't think a DevOps workflow for SaaS or anything else is much different. Uh, SaaS is something where you're just, you're running the infrastructure for your customers versus a lot of develop DevOps people, their customers are internal. To me, SaaS is just external, right? It's just a different customer set. And maybe with SaaS, you get more customers than you would in a typical thousand person business or 10,000 person business. So I wouldn't treat it any differently. If you go look at my Docker con talk, I talk about that in my, actually in my all hands, it wasn't my Docker con. So if you just go look up my all hands repo, which I have been showing off a lot lately, um, over here, github.com slash Brett Fisher. And you can find all my examples in at the main part of my repo in the main page. And in the all hands, I give a bunch of DevOps workflows, not all of them, right? I'm not, I don't have Terraform in there yet or Ansible stuff in there yet, but when it comes to container stuff, building containers, testing containers, scanning them for vulnerabilities, deploying them with Argo or deploying them um, to a K3D cluster for more testing, whatever, you can just jump on my GitHub page and look through all my examples. I should have something there that helps you. Hopefully that helps. Any way I can do labs for AWS DevOps from your recommendation? I've been trying to get hands-on lab training. Uh, Mark, I don't know anything about that. Um, are you talking about the AWS De DevOps certification? Or are you just talking about using AWS infrastructure to play with DevOps stuff? Um, I would say there's the free tier. So if you create an account, you get a certain amount of limited resources. If you... Um, I don't know what else. I'm not really an expert on AWS learning free resources or whatever for AWS learning. So sorry, I can't help you there. Hello, hello. What, um, okay, so I already asked that question. Error reporting, logging, monitoring, site health. So. I don't know. Yeah. So to build a SaaS, you're, hmm. it's again, it's the same tools. It's the same tools for SaaS as anything else. Like when I'm operating infrastructure in a data center or in a private cloud, to me, I'm doing the same things as terms of, you know, when I'm, I'm running a business DevOps team, our, you know, our requirements for uptime are probably very similar to a SaaS itself. So I don't see that as really a differentiating factor. Um, the, the tool set again in my GitHub repo. I'm just trying to think of anything else I can think of. Um, I am a fan of logging, monitoring, all those things using SaaS tools to do that. Most teams don't have the expertise nor the, the people to run all those tools open source, right? Running your own container registry, your own centralized logging solution like Lo Loki, running Prometheus and the dozens of containers it takes to run a true production Prometheus system. Those, those take dedicated people to do. So it's okay if you want to do that stuff for to get experience. But usually when I see a team and they're already very busy, I don't recommend more of those what I call plumbing tools that there's dozens of options for SaaS products that you can get, right? There's just Datadog. I mean, there's just Sysdig. 
I, I could I could list probably 20 without having to go search the internet and honeycomb. There's just things in things out there. There's the elastic search stuff now that you can do on their hosted platform. There's um Kibana and um what is it the what is it, the Kibana Cloud? I'm trying to think what they call it now. Uh there's just so many of these places where you can get logging, image storage, image scanning, automation, all those things. I tend to try to do as much as I can in GitHub just because all my code is there. All my clients, all their code is there. My students tend to put their code there. All the open source is there. So I, when I have my code there, I try to keep the tooling as much as I can in GitHub. So I try to use as much of their stuff as I can. And then I'll plug on other things like monitoring and logging on top of that. But I try to go for SaaS just to save time. It's cheaper than another DevOps engineer, that's for sure. I don't care how expensive it is. It's definitely cheaper than hiring someone to run it all um, until you get to a very large scale where you would need like multiple people probably to handle that. So any thoughts or recommendations on hosting static JS websites in Kubernetes example, build with Node and host with Nginx in the image? Um, let's see. So static JavaScript websites. So like a, a, a front end website, well, you don't have to do that in Kubernetes. First off, if you did cl Google Cloud Run, you, you're technically doing the same kind of things. You're creating a container, putting all your files in the container, shipping the image, but you don't have to worry about running Kubernetes. And it works really well. So if you don't have to run Kubernetes because you're running static sites, there's Fastly, there's... Um, um, let's see what's the <laughs> what's the one that I use for um, all my sites? I have to go look that up now. Um, obviously, GitHub hosts static sites, uh, and you can hide those behind a domain. And then for my courses. Um, let's see. I don't know why I forgot the name of this, uh, this tool I use. Oh, well, maybe I'll think of it later, but it's like one of the many static sites like the, that you can host static content on. <laughs> uh, actually, let me go in here. I think I can find it in here. I use it for my Docker, my Kubernetes mastery course. I don't know why I can't remember what I'm using. Anywho, yeah, S3. There's just, there's so many different things out there you can do uh, to host. And all of them work fine. Like if it's a SaaS and they're hosting static content for you, probably awesome. Probably uh, something you should check out if you're looking at that. Try to, trying to avoid running or managing your own Kubernetes just to host a static website. That's totally unnecessary. But if you had a bunch more requirements, then you know maybe you would maybe you would run Kubernetes. We build images on servers with Docker Engine installed. Docker build is it possible to build without Docker installed? Just Buildx, if that makes any sense. Um, so with BuildKit, as far as I know, it does require an engine. It doesn't like I think Buildx has a service. If you run Build BuildKit yourself, Uh, if you run build kit yourself, I think it's still, I'm just checking. I think it still requires a daemon running in the background. Uh, let's see. Containerizing. Hmm. Daemonless. So uh, just go check out build kit. Uh, I'm showing you right here. Check out the build kit repo under Moby. They have a daemonless version. I'm not exactly sure if that gets the job done. You, I mean, obviously it's running in a container. So there's also, um, somebody's gonna remember in chat, what's the tool, uh, the Kubernetes hosted build tool. There's several of them now. I have not used any of them. <laughs> I use GitHub to build all, Docker Hub and, build, and GitHub to build all my images. So um, there's, a couple of projects out there that build, let me see if I can't find them.
Um, there's also Slim AI. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, Canico. That's a little old. I don't know if that's still supported. I haven't used any of these tools. So to me, they almost always depend on BuildKit anyway. So they... Um, Yeah, it still looks supported. So there's the the Google tool here, Canico. I believe that's how you pronounce it. And then there's a few other ones that I found a few locations for tools near you. The first one is Beach Cancel. Stop. Google, stop. <laughs> hey Google, stop. She thought I was talking to her. I did say Google. All right. Let's see if I can catch up on chat. Hello, Albert. Thanks for loving the podcast. Recommendations on PV backup for self-hosted rancher cluster. Um, I feel like rancher is going to have a couple of charts in it that are already for backups. The one that I have used. Let me pull it up here. There, I have not used Kasten which is a Veeam product is, I don't believe it's free. If you're looking strictly for open source, um, the one I have used and actually had on the show, Valero. Let me see if I can pull these up. So there's free open source tools. There's several of them. The one that I have used, um, I, and for a lot of these tool suggestions, right? For, for all of you that are asking about tools, what is a good tool for this? What is a good tool for that? Just go to landscape. Dot cncf. Dot io, I believe. Yeah. So landscape. Dot cncf. Dot io, and this is every product, open source and closed source that is a part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, a nonprofit that basically, this is the who's who. Like if, they, if they're meant to back up Kubernetes, they're in this list. And there's probably a dedicated category. If we look at, let's see, platform, I'm pretty sure there's a backup provisioning. I'm going to be sad if there's no backup. <laughs> so there's no, so there's, doesn't seem to be a backup, backup category, which makes me sad. Um, and for example, uh, let's see if I can find. So Valero is under. Under runtime, cloud native storage. So maybe you search for, for the category cloud native storage, and there'll maybe be some other tools there. Um, that is not storage. That is not storage. Don't know why it's not filtering. Anyway, oh, it's grouping. Um, so storage. And. See if I recognize anything else for backups. Um, so Kasten is uh, won by Veeam. So if there's a lot of shops that are a Veeam shop for paid data center backups, like they pay you know, kind of like um, 
all the other old like Windows based backup tools back in the day. Uh, so you might check that out. A lot of these are storage providers. They're not backups. So it's kind of weird. They don't have a dedicated um, backup category. But for anyone out there that has tried a backup tool in Kubernetes, if you know of one, throw it out there in chat, throw it out. Yeah, I'm sure there's a couple other backup backup tools, but they're clearly not labeled here. So the point here though, is that you, you, if you're looking for tooling besides just Googling, this is a place I usually go, right? I know the, I know a product, so I go find its category, I look at its competitors. I dig around and see their popularity. All these things have a, you know, a popularity in indicator basically, which is their GitHub stars, which doesn't, it's not a guarantee that it's popular. It just means that people saw it and clicked the button. Uh, they may not even be using it anymore. I certainly don't go uncheck tools that, you know, and I, I, I there's good and bad things about GitHub stars, right? So I, that's what I do. That's how I go figure it out. Or I just watch all of the Twitter stuff about Kubernetes. And then if I catch something that is about backups, I would then go check it out. So good question though. Uh, is Captain worth the time and effort to build a proper DevOps workflow? I don't know what Captain is, so I don't know. Sorry, if, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, you're using Docker Swarm mode and self-hosted clusters due to customer requirements and are not wanting to maintain a Kubernetes cluster. That's the thing, is there's still Swarm and Nomad, and if these things are working for you, there's, you know, if it works, it works, right? Like, it's... Um, it's not really getting bug fixes, but if it if you don't have bugs, then you know have at it. It's totally fine with me. I think it, you know for that kind of use case, if you have really small environments like single host environments that don't have to be redundant, or it's just three systems they're relatively small. It's not running that many containers. Uh, K3s is usually the one that people recommend here because it's the most mature, minimal distribution. K3d is a great way to run for testing, because that's K3S in a Docker container. That's what I use for testing. And K3S is a really great small distribution of Kubernetes. It's still, it, it only saves time and resources in terms of the initial deployment of Kubernetes. Once that's done, it's still just as complex as every other Kubernetes. I think a lot of people complain about the complexity of Kubernetes and then people suggest K3S like I just did. The reality is your manifest, your Helm charts, your customize, all your tooling, it all is gonna be just as complex as before, but if you can get away with just Swarm and nothing on top of it, you could probably get away with K3D, or sorry, K3S natively on that VM, and you would only have to maintain your manifest or your Helm chart or customize or however you configure your application. Anyway, uh, let's see, what is the difference between SRE and DevOps, which is easier to get into as an IT help desk? Definitely DevOps. The reason I say that is because if you're on the IT help desk side, presumably you're not a developer. So presumably you're more of a configuration and troubleshooting. Uh, IT help desk is usually desktop oriented. So you got to work your way from IT help desk into sysadmin. Somehow you need to get a job where you understand more about servers. And then that uh, will lead you into caring more about infrastructure, how that infrastructure is built, maintaining that infrastructure, keeping it updated, secure, and that starts to get you into the world of DevOps. IT support obviously doesn't you know, really, there's DevOps principles that we could apply to IT help desk and IT support. By the way, that's where I got my career started 30 years ago. But my, my way into DevOps was through servers, through operations, through mostly configuration engineering, not development, software development engineering. I mean, we were writing scripts, but we weren't writing full-fledged, you know, hundreds of files in a program kind of thing to deploy for customers, right? We, our customer was the developer as well as the people using the developer's apps. So that's how I got into DevOps. And I was more on the ops side of DevOps because there's many jobs in DevOps. Um, one way for developers to get into DevOps, I see that's very often, is someone's just a strict developer, and then they start to focus on the build environments. They want to be able to build the images or test the software better. So they design the automation 
around build, test, build, test over and over. And that gets them interested in automation, in sort of scaling things up, being able to recreate things from scratch. Then they start to learn infrastructure as code. That's sort of a developer's common gateway. But for an operator or someone in IT sysadmin like stuff, you need to focus on servers and clouds. I think that's going to be a better way for you to get into DevOps rather than saying, go learn a programming language. Because if you don't know any programming languages, knowing one isn't necessarily going to make you better at DevOps or easier to get into DevOps. You just want to focus on those jobs that are more on the ops and infrastructure side, because those definitely exist. A lot of the DevOps teams I work with, they're focused on automating infrastructure. And the dev team will maybe have one or two of their people that are DevOps focused that focus on build environments, testing environments, automating all of that over and over. And then they sort of meet in the middle, right? You have some people focused on infrastructure, some people focused on build and testing. Sometimes if you're in a really small shop, you do all of that. But um, that's that would be my advice. Um, go read the DevOps handbook, go get some certifications in the cloud, learn Linux, learn networking better, get a networking or a security certification on just Linux. And then that'll start to give you a gateway into the DevOps toolkit. Um, by the way, for those of you asking about DevOps, I have, uh, let's see, brett.show slash DevOps. If you just type in brett.show slash DevOps, you will find a big old list of opinions and things that I have, steps I have, things you should do, especially when you're, um, the question specifically was around developers, but I answer both. If you're a developer, how do you get in? If you're a sysadmin or on the IT side, how do you get in? And there's also great courses, like there's one on LinkedIn. I specifically do not have a DevOps fundamentals. And I keep saying this every time I get a chance, Learning DevOps isn't about learning tools. That comes later. When you're first focused on what DevOps is, you need to read books like the DevOps Handbook or um, any of the other Gene Kim books. He, he helped write that book. There's a whole group of them that helped write it. But go look up those authors, read their books, All right? DevOps Handbook, second edition. I tend to read it every couple of years just because it is the found, is one of the, foundations of the mindset of DevOps, because you have to understand those principles, the practices, the mindset, the reason that DevOps exists before you ever touch a tool. Um, anyway. Hey, thanks for the super chat. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You get the horns today, my friend. You get the horns. Uh, Nikhil, I, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Nikhil, thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate it. All right, back to the questions. I'm trying to catch up. A few words on pod security admission and integrating this with Kyverno. Um, so I had a whole show on Kyverno. So go back in this channel. I have one of the founders, I believe, of Kyverno on. We go through some demos, but that's the most I've used Caverno. So <laughs> us watching, doing it on the show, he was doing it, I was watching. I've never actually used it in production, so I don't have a lot of advice there. But it seems like it's an easier way to deal with policies, all that stuff. So go back. It's only a couple months old. It was definitely this year, I believe. But go back on this channel and just search for that. Good question. Um, any tips to anyone on how, uh, how to, how to move from bamboo to GitLab CICD running windows related builds? Um, I don't have any advice. I think it's, you're pretty much going to have to go from scratch as far as I know. And I would, I would try to use their extension model or their plugin model or whatever they call it at GitLab. I forget the terminology. Um, I would try to use that as much as possible. I always try to avoid handwriting my own scripts to do any sort of CI or CD work. The goal there is that you're using other people's tools. That's why I talk about this several times, including my um, all hands talk that I mentioned previously. Again, go to my GitHub for the all hands. I talk about in the all hands that 
the reason that the future of these CI solutions are places like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, these places where your code already exists, the automation tools of the future, I think, will be those code places. There's a consolidation happening. Companies are getting bought up. There's way too many CI players out there. And the I think the future of automation, and I'm not even going to call it CI and CD, but the future future of these automation platforms is really getting it as close to your code as possible. And GitLab is, is one of them, right? So the power of these tools is their marketplace for all the add-ons, all the functionality you want to add, building the images, testing the images, scanning them for vulnerabilities, deploying them with Argo, you know, setting up temporary test infrastructure or epic based or PR based infrastructure where things are automatically available with a automatically created DNS name. All of these things are possible, but hopefully the platform you're on has all those tools already built in, either made by them or by third parties. That's definitely true on GitHub. GitHub has well over 10,000 plugins now in their marketplace. They're called Actions. And this is the power of the ecosystem. Just like we all are adopting open source because it's someone else doing the work for us and we're working on layers of abstraction, the same thing is true of automation platforms. So if your automation platform doesn't have thousands and thousands of these marketplace tools, it's probably not the one for you. There's probably a better one out there that has all those plugins. For example, there are tools like this CI tools today that exist. People use them, but they don't even use BuildKit, something that Docker created five years ago, to build your images, which are faster. They provide more fe features and functionality. And some of these tools don't even have that, right? So the challenge here is that you really don't want to have to manually do all this yourself. The, back in the day when we were using Jenkins, maybe drones, some of these other tools, there was a lot of scripting, a lot of manual configuration, and you want all of this stuff to live in your repos with your code in YAML or whatever language they've chosen to configure it. And you want to be able to use other people's work instead of having to make a bunch of bash scripts or Python scripts, whatever, for running your CI. So that's my only advice really, really there. I don't have, I myself for my own stuff and for my customers, we use GitHub. I move them all to GitHub because it's usually better than what they have. But GitLab is a great choice too. All right. Let me, let me get caught up here real quick. Um, Shahan, the question you have about the secrets for the, making an entry point script. Yes. You're going to have to do that for swarm because unfortunately swarm, unlike Kubernetes swarm does not make a secret and environment variable. So you will need an entry point script. Just go look at the MySQL or the Postgres official images. Just go to Docker Hub, find one of those, click on one of their versions, and then you can look at the entry point script in GitHub, and it has a block of code for taking secrets. It's usually at the top, and it takes secrets and it turns them into environment variables. Go look up that segment of code, and that's what you should use. It's a great base. You It does it in Bash. I would try that. Um, Ansible to deploy and provision Kubernetes clusters. So um, you're going to need Ansible at some point if you're managing your own servers. But I don't advise people to use their own servers. We're, if you're in the cloud, we're now at the point where there's very little reason for you to manually deal with operating systems in a cloud. There are all these services now, uh, multiple ways you can run con containers and run Kubernetes without ever touching a server, without ever having to do an apt update or a yum update, right? Or do security scans or install security agents. Like these, these are concepts that are going away. We, the cloud originally over a decade ago, removed the need for us to care about hardware down. We don't have to care about power or cooling or the hardware itself. And now what's happening next is we're removing the requirement for you to manage the operating system. So when I think of Ansible, I think Ansible is the tool that is, is still used to manage things in the OS. And if you're, to use, if you're using a cloud, 
you should just use their Kubernetes and don't manage the the nodes. You know, use their the entire solution they have. I mentioned Google Cloud Run earlier. It doesn't even show Kubernetes off. Like you don't even have the idea of Kubernetes. You're just running containers. And this is the future of all the clouds. They're all focusing on getting you away from managing the operating system because we don't do it. Most teams don't patch every month if they have to manage their own infrastructure. They have long running um, servers, which makes them brittle because if they replace it, something changed on that server and then when they replace it, it's broken. So the idea is that your nodes are disposable, they should be replaced on a regular basis and that you shouldn't have to be managing those servers. I find teams all the time that give me reasons that aren't good reasons for running their own servers. And so unless you have a, a significantly sized team of like five people that are full-time ops managing infrastructure like this and managing servers, or you have your own data center, you don't need to manage your own servers, which means you won't need Ansible. If you're doing just the cloud, Terraform will do all that for you. But when you need to actually start going into servers and you know, adding app to get packages, changing this Etsy file config, all that stuff. Ansible tends to be a little bit better at that, uh, a little easier at that. Depends, but that's how I think of Ansible. So I, Ansible to me is the tool I use as a last resort when I have to manage the servers directly and I have to SSH into them and deal with what's on them. And I can't just make an image of what I need and then just deploy the image, right? Um, anyway, that's my thoughts. Um, not that Ansible is bad, it's just... Why, why use it if I don't have to? Because I'm definitely going to have to use Terraform. I almost always have to use Terraform. So, <laughs> Maz, I don't know what you said Notion for, but yes, I like Notion. Notion is a thing. Um, cloud Guru or Cloud Academy? Um, I'm a Udemy person, so I stick with Udemy. If it was me now learning and getting into the community, I would probably get a subscription, a personal subscription to Udemy because it gives you the best 4,000 courses, including tons of cloud stuff, certification stuff, all the infrastructure tools, the best four or 5,000 courses on the platform. Um, I would do a Udemy subscription. So that's just me, because I live on that platform. I, my courses are on that platform. So I use it daily, I know it and understand it. Um, all the other platforms are trying to catch up, in my opinion. They, they don't have the breadth of courses. They're maybe their courses might be a little more outdated, you just, you know, that's my experience. All right, I got it. Looks like I got a long question coming up next. But hey, thank you so much. Lakshmi, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate you. All right. Uh, let's see. Let me get back up here to the question. Okay, we have a long question coming up. Oh, I think you... Um, Avariandun? Sorry if I mispronounced that. I think you asked this question. Did you ask in the, were you asking this, core, this question in uh, chat somewhere? Um, you're talking about services. DNS and services. You're able to access the pods using cluster IP address with the port from other pods, but I'm not able to do the same with DNS names. Um, so DNS, a core DNS only works inside pods. So it won't work outside of pods. It won't work from the host. It won't work from outside the cluster. That's expected. That's normal. So inside the pods, those pods their resolve file, basically their DNS resolution, because again, remember a pod gets its own IP address, its own NIC. So when it resolve, it's going to the core DNS server to get its DNS back. If you're on the host, it's not using core DNS for its DNS resolver. You can go to the host and look in its resolve file, and it will tell you that it's probably using the hoster's you know, DNS, the common DNS for all servers. And so they're not, and the, core D, the core DNS inside the cluster is for pods inside. Everything else, you're going to have to use external DNS or use, you know, if you're using a node port service, that means you're going to have to use the host IP or whatever the host DNS is to get to that service that has been published on the node port. Hopefully that makes sense. 
And that's always been like that for Kubernetes. So it's not a version issue. It's just simply, that's not how core DNS works when it's inside a Kubernetes cluster. And that's a great point from uh, Sabin is your, sometimes your backup tools will be related to your storage provider. For example, maybe if you've got NetApp, like a high-end data center storage like that, you know, they do snapshots and all that stuff inside the cluster. It's not necessarily something that you would do in Kubernetes, but they might have their own specific ways to do it. So. Thank you uh, for thanking me, <laughs> Avaro. Uh, good luck. Good luck with the code cloud. Um, Mumshot and team are great, and I wish them all the luck. Someday, I hope to <laughs> do something with Mumshot Manabot uh, out of Singapore. He's got a bunch of court courses. He's got. A, I'm assuming he's got a team because they put out some great stuff there. So uh, if you're having good luck with that, then stick with it. Vendor, uh, James is asking about, is it better to focus on one vendor, say AWS, or generally learn Git, Docker, Kubernetes, and learn how to use them across all public clouds? So if you have to, usually you want to pick one thing to learn at a time. If, you, if you're not in a job today, if you're in a job today, use, learn their cloud, right? Learn all the fundamentals. Take a couple of the fundamental certifications for their cloud. I don't normally advise people in junior or even intermediate roles go learn multiple clouds unless they're looking to get a job with a company that uses that cloud. You will see this on job application or on job requirements. So if you're looking at jobs, the jobs you're targeting, go focus on their tooling. So you can't do it all, right? You can't learn all the clouds. I certainly don't know all the, the, the top three clouds equally. I don't know Google, Azure, and AWS equally. I know some parts of each and different things in different ones. And I've been doing this for 30 years. So you have to sort of pick and choose. Absolutely, AWS is the most popular with Azure behind that and then Google behind that. So it depends on also what part of the world are you trying to apply for? If you're trying to go for tech companies or startups, they're probably more likely to be in Google or in AWS. Not always true, but um, if they are predominantly an enterprise company, company they're probably going to be somewhere between AWS and Azure. Azure was traditionally a very Windows, Microsoft-focused ar architecture, and that's why they would, they would incentivize people that were buying a lot of Microsoft licenses to use Azure. Not so much the case anymore, but those are just general trends. So yes, you have to, absolutely would pick, pick one. And then learn, go deep, learn three or four or five of their tools, right? Learn some of their services, not just how to deploy a server in a network. And then over time, maybe years from now, you may be bothered with another cloud. You know, learn one thing at a time with each cloud separately. Don't do it all at the same time. But I would learn a cloud, at least the basic functionality. What I mean is, you know how to automate it, you know how to use infrastructure as code with it, and you know how to create servers, networks, firewalls, load balancers, storage, all that basic stuff, right? Maybe some object storage, like an S3 type storage. And then, maybe a database or two, then after that, I would go and learn agnostic tools. Um, along the way, you're going to learn Docker, that's the basics, but Kubernetes is valuable, but Kubernetes without knowing anything about a cloud would sort of hamper your experience in learning Kubernetes because a cloud Kubernetes is one of the most popular ways to run Kubernetes now. So I would sort of learn a little bit about a cloud, maybe go learn some Docker, a little bit more about that same cloud, go learn a bit more about Linux, go learn more about that cloud, go learn some Kubernetes, go learn more about that cloud and stick with those because you're gonna, it's gonna be easier for you to get a job if you have three or four AWS certifications rather than you saying, I have one certification in Azure, one certification on AWS and one certification on Google. At that point, you're, you know a lot of, you know a little bit about some things, but I think it'd be better for you to go after jobs that are focused on what you're learning and certifying on. So that's just me. All right. 
What are the, some of the diagrams that you use with other teams? I usually use C4, but they fall short at time. Um, some of the diagrams that I use with other teams, I am not a diagram person, honestly. I So what I'm normally doing is helping a team adopt more documentation. I don't normally do it for them. And they usually have an existing tool. I'm not sure if you're asking me about tool. I don't know what C4 is. So maybe you can help me with that, Marcelo. Um, I, I try nowadays with diagramming to get the diagram to be code. <laughs> this is actually something where there's a, I have a couple of favorite tools, but, uh, and I'm, I need to do like a whole show on that, maybe on diagramming. Um, but you know, people go traditionally, we all went to Visio and other tools like that. Now we do web-based tools mostly, but I think that the trend now is to try to see if you can't use a, a way to create your basically write. I say code, but write a data language, like a YAML language, something like that, and um, or JSON or whatever it might be. And then it makes the diagram for you. That allows you to version the diagrams and update them relatively easy. You can put it into a Git workflow. Um, and let me see if I can't find the tool, if that's, if that's what you're asking. Maybe if you're not asking about tools, so sorry, I misunderstood your question. Um, Yeah, I'm not gonna be able to find this. Let me see, search my GitHub stars. Um, I think Mermaid is it? Yeah, so this is the one that I have used with Teams that are very code oriented and they want to keep their diagrams as code, describe them in code. I don't mean coding languages necessarily, but Mermaid. Um, so you can see, if we just go to their website. So just search Mermaid diagrams and you can see that they have everything from flow diagrams to networking diagrams and they do it all through a data language not necessarily code. And so it's very flexible and it allows you to store and version these things over time. And then um, what I've seen teams do is they'll store this in GitHub, have it generate the images, put the images back in the repo, and then they can include those images in their documentation. So their documentation might be on some other platform, but they can basically embed these images from GitHub. And as the image gets updated, they don't need to have a special program. They don't need to then save the image as a PNG and then put it in the documentation manually. Like that, that process tends to break down over time. So I'm not sure if that's what you were asking, but if that's helpful to anyone. Um, yeah. Mermaid, look for that. Mermaid diagrams. How to provide security for AKS in terms of networking, such as opening the ports and allow applications to public internet? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not an AKS person, so I'm not going to have a specific answer for that. Sorry. Um, but you have the you have the DevOps server, ten thousand people, <laughs> ten thousand people on there. Hello, Zef. Hello, hello. Takir, sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, very basic question, sure. Where can we see right now in real life Docker used? I mean, companies, small and big. It's hard for me to motivate myself to learn it when I don't see the final touch. Um, at this point, I don't, I mean, everyone, <laughs> I, say, I hate to say everyone uses it. Um, every major company that I'm aware of uses it. Banks use it. Pick a bank. They're using it. Um, you know, every tech company in the world, every software company in the world is pretty much using containers now. Uh, if you're looking at CNCF, which is Cloud Native Computing Foundation is a nonprofit help. It is connected to the Linux Foundation, which runs Linux. 
And CNCF is now the future of design for computing. It's essentially encapsulating all of the latest design tools, ideas, and the assumption for almost all those tools is that you're running containers. So you can't really do anything with CNCF unless you first start with containers. Usually learning containers means you're learning Docker first. There's lots of ways to run containers now besides Docker, but Docker tends to be the first tool you learn. Hence my course, Docker Mastery, because it's sort of the gateway to all these tools. So at this point, I don't know how, it would be harder for me to find you a major company that's not using Docker than it would be for me to find one. Like, um, it, it's just everywhere. I mean, five years ago, major international companies were announcing that, you know, significant portions of their infrastructure were Kubernetes, which means they're running co containers, running Docker. Um, so I, I, I would challenge you to find a major, not, not a small company, right? If you only have a, an IT team of five with two developers, you maybe are getting by with, without containers at this point still. But if you're making software for a living, if you have developers writing software, chances are there's already containers there. So it's pretty prevalent. Like <laughs> it's everywhere. Um, I'm, it's not a bad question. It's just, I don't, I, you know, pick a company, pick a major company, pick a brand you've heard of, Apple. They use containers. Um, Walmart, heavily user, heavy user of containers. Um, you know, Amazon uses containers all day long. Microsoft only using containers and like containers all day long. Um, you just name a brand, Gap, they use containers. Um, you know, name a clothing brand, name Nike, they're using containers. Um, they're just all... Everything's containers now, especially if you're providing s software and services to others that you write yourself, which is most companies nowadays, most major companies. That's a great, great question. Great discussion. Um, who's not using containers, right? That would be an interesting uh, breakdown of if it's large companies, thousand employees or more, and they're not using containers and they have reasons. So... Um, so for troubleshooting Docker and reinstalling Docker, I, that really depends on your situation. Um, I, I would, if you're troubleshooting something, I would suggest going over there and asking in the Docker channel on our, our discord server, go there, ask in the Docker channel. Maybe people can give you some tips. Um, if you've reinstalled Docker on a machine and containers and services are not working, I'm not really... It, it's very dependent on the infrastructure. Are you talking about your local machine, a Linux server? Like there's so many questions. And unfortunately, I, I don't have time today to help you troubleshoot that particular problem. But that's why we have the Discord server. <laughs> Congrats, Akaish. Sorry if I mispronounced that. successfully completed my first freelance DevOps task. Very cool. So I've been a freelancer for over a decade. So I guess I will cheers you for both DevOps and being a freelancer because it's not easy. Uh, there's lots of freedom, but also <laughs> lots of work and stress when you do freelancing. Um, can we have persistent volumes from multiple replicas of MySQL in Swarm? Um, well, in general, I would say yes and no. The, the no is you shouldn't make multiple replicas of MySQL and Swarm. That's not, the, the intention of replicas in Swarm is to have identical copies of containers running. And in MySQL, you need a, uh, a main server, the what used to be called the master server, you have the control server, and then you have the other replic, you have the other copies or mirrors of MySQL. And that usually requires you make a service for each because they need different settings, they need co different configurations, and I find it much easier to just keep those separate. You can put them on the same network and they behave the same way. So, and then you can just, you know, add them Docker volumes and now they have persistent storage. So I would do it that way. Swarm services weren't really ever great at running persistent data uh, with, you know, multiple replicas that each has persistent data. That's wasn't really in the cards for them.
All right. Um, Alexander asks, do you know something about that Docker, what to introduce its own service mesh? No, Docker, Docker is not in the orchestration or server business anymore. Docker is focused on developer tools. And that mostly means things like Docker desktop, Docker hub, and they still make the Docker engine that you can run on servers, but they're not looking to, that's why they're not working on swarm really anymore. And they're not adding new tooling to the server. They sold that business to Mirantis and they sold, I mean, they, they got rid of hundreds of employees. They basically moved from Docker over to Mirantis three years ago. And that was all their operations, enterprise business of servers and orchestration and all that. So I don't think Docker would ever, at this point, they're, they're never going to have a, a service mesh of their own. If you're looking at different service meshes, which by the way, I don't think most people need them. You, you need to be a pretty advanced shop and really know Kubernetes and all the other parts well before I think you need, and you need to know why you're, what problems you have. If you don't, if everything you have is fine and you like it the way it works, service mesh is probably not for you. Service mesh solves specific problems that if you don't have those problems and you don't know that you have those problems, then, you know, service mesh is just a solution to a problem you may not have. But um, if you go look up layer5.io, um, layer5 is a website that, helps you manage service meshes and they have a tool called meshery. They also have another tool that helps you compare the performance of service meshes. So go check out layer five. Um, run, it's actually, I think founded by a friend of mine who we're planning to have on this show, uh, this summer, I believe, or somewhere after that, we're just talking about it now to have them on about their Docker desktop extension. So, um, would you mind explaining or showing how a sidecar pod and Kubernetes works. So sidecar, sidecars, I don't know. I feel like sidecars are usually unnecessary if you're designing your architecture better. For example, if you're designing your logs to be, to go to standard out, standard error, then you don't need a sidecar for logging and monitoring. You can just send those to somewhere else. Um, and a sidecar is just another container in the pod. So it's nothing inherently special about it. There's not a sidecar type. There's just other containers in the pod. And I don't normally see them when an application is designed for cloud native and it's designed around all the 12 factors. So if you're if you're focused on 12 factor and cloud native design, you hopefully don't need sidecars. You can just deploy your pods and you don't need those other ones. You don't need, you know, startup and you know things to help you start up and all that sort of thing there are things such as init containers which is not technically a sidecar and init container is often used to check that other things are available for the contain before the container starts up or uh, maybe it seeds the database or it does database migrations before the container starts up or something like that and that's known as an init container i-n-i-t and that's another type of container in the pod so just go look that up there's really only two types that I'm aware of in pods. There's containers and init containers. <laughs> so hopefully that helps. Good question. Good question. Congratulations on passing your, your uh, AZ900. I'm not sure which one that is, but um, Azure Cloud, awesome. Um, secure containers like Kata, Gvisor, Firecracker, those things are all fine if you need them. Um, you typically only need stuff like that if you are in a multi-tenant scenario where you may be hosting other people's code or you have customers where you want to ensure that one customer can't affect in any way, like maybe they're running code in those containers that you're providing them. So unless you're doing that, I, I think that those are very far down the list. When I look at a team, um, I have, by the way, a security checklist. I'll just bring that up called security first. And um, security first, put that in chat. So um, nowhere on that list is running Firecracker or GVISE or something like that. Because usually those are so far down the list that by the time you get would get to them, you know that you need them because of some requirement whether it's 
isolating your different customers that you're hosting or uh, some sort of auditing or financial you know, reasons or whatever. So that's what you would do. But I wouldn't do it before then. Mostly what I see people in their first few years of containers, they're not they're still shipping images with tons of vulnerabilities in them. They're not removing privilege escalation in Kubernetes. Basically, just go run kubescan. If you're running Kubernetes or kubescape, let me just bring that up. Um, so go look up this tool and run it on your clusters. There's also the Docker benchmark tool if you're still running Docker on servers. Um, but if you're running Kubernetes, Go check out this tool and it's going to do an analysis of your environment and will probably have tons of recommendations before you'd ever get to Firecracker, Kata containers or GVisor or whatever, right? There's probably much bigger things you need to do, like not running as root in the container or turning on user namespaces or implementing better RBAC policies inside your Kubernetes cluster itself so that, you know, or just removing administrators from access to the cluster at all. And the only way they can access the cluster is through Argo or through GitOps, places where they don't have shell access to the server, or possibly putting in something like Fargo. Fargo is a tool that will monitor your clusters. It sits in your clusters. You can run it as a container and it sits there and looks for anyone doing anything Mis that that you would flag as not normal, like running a cube control exec inside the cluster, probably not normal. That should be flagged and logged and alerted somewhere. So those are all sorts of tools. Those are all in my security list that I just put in chat. And I would check those out before I would ever worry about running a virtualization wrapper around the container itself. Not that that's not a bad thing to do. It's just there's other easier things that would probably result in better security anyway. Um, cool. Good question. I like it. I'm just reading and catching up. Um, Andres, would you recommend some proofs of concept that we can carry out? Uh, go look at my GitHub, github.com slash Brett Fisher. I have tons of tools there, demos, um, examples, all my, my up-to-date conference talks, my course examples. There's new stuff this year, for example, tons of new stuff this year, just on automation and GitHub using GitHub actions for automating all the things for how to find a a really good or build a really good secure base image. Those are all in GitHub. So I would say go there. There's plenty, of, there's days worth of activities for you to do inside my GitHub. And if you go to my main GitHub page, it's a nice readme. It's listing all the things and puts them in a, in little subject in, in groups. So go check that out. <laughs> How to learn Kubernetes. That's why I'm here. Take my courses, links below. All the coupons are there. Um, you can learn Kubernetes, Docker, and more. Good luck. Pulumi, Pulumi is great. Uh, if you if you want to try Pulumi instead of Terraform, great. Now, what I would expect, and I don't know this for sure, but what I would expect is Pulumi is relatively new compared to Terraform. So, if you're going to use Pulumi, which is infrastructure as code in code, it's actually in code, um, then Pulumi probably doesn't have all the plugins or extensions or providers or modules or whatever all the terms are that you would have in Terraform or other older tools, right? Tools that have been around a long time like Terraform almost always have the plugin you're looking for. So with Pulumi, I would expect less of that. So if you've got an extensive amount of Terraform, Pulumi is not necessarily gonna be better. It's just different. If you're someone who's more on the ops side and you prefer the Tomo language, you, pr you prefer Terraform, TF files. If you like that way of doing things and you're familiar with that, just stick with that. But if you're a developer and you prefer to stick more in your your language that you, that you want to use, like you're a, J a JavaScript person and you would rather write your infrastructure in JavaScript, go check out Pulumi. That's an option you can try. But I don't necessarily have a favorite. I tend to lean more on the ops side and I'm used to Terraform. 
So I don't use Plumi currently for any of my projects. Not that I couldn't, I just, I know Terraform, so I use that. What books or courses do you recommend for developers need to become DevOps and software architects? So obviously I'm biased. My courses will teach you some of the tools that you would use in DevOps. It won't teach you DevOps fundamentals because those aren't about tools. And we've already talked about that. Just rewind the show 30 minutes, listen to me talk about that stuff. There's, um, there's also a link if you scroll up in the chat, there is a link for DevOps fundamentals, uh, brett.show slash DevOps. And you go check that out. There's a whole list there of recommendations, including DevOps fundamental courses that you can try. And then software architects. I'm not a software architect, so I'm an infrastructure architect. I don't necessarily design software in you know, the internals of a software program. That's not really my focus. So I won't be good at telling you where to go get that. But if you're learning DevOps, and you like to read, DevOps Handbook is always my number one recommendation, DevOps Handbook. And that all of that's listed at brett.show slash DevOps. Do I teach in my courses how to map a config file to Helm Charts config file? Um, no, but a Helm chart, when you say config file, are you talking about a config map in Kubernetes? Ariel, I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about, but if you're talking about config maps, config maps behave the same way as a Helm chart template as they do in a standard customize or Kubernetes manifest. So um, I teach config maps in my conf Kubernetes mastery course, but I don't teach Helm charts yet in that course. That is coming someday. It's on my list. I don't know when I'm going to add it. Um, what is the default home directory of Docker containers? There is not one. I guess the default is root, the root directory slash uh, the base of the operating system would be the default. Good question. Interesting. I've not had that one before. Um, one more question from Jeff. I have one more question regarding Docker learning Docker, Kubernetes, and Swarm. If I lose motivation to keep learning Docker, um, thanks. I, I'm glad you think my course is great. Thank you. What would, what would be your tip to get back in and start learning again? I mean, obviously life goals and job are the main reason, but if that fails, I'm currently unemployed. Would you keep recommending for a student to keep watching and finishing your training? If you're not motivated, um, take a break. Um, if I think curiosity and an innate desire to, to learn new things is fundamental to all tech jobs. So if you're feeling like you're just done learning, that's totally fine. Just take a break and make a goal for yourself. You know, take a two week break and say, I'm going to come back. I'm going to go, I don't know, play some Xbox. I'm going to go <laughs> learn a real life skill like um, carpentry. I don't know. So yeah, do something like that. Uh, I like, I like, you know, doing stuff in the kitchen, cooking meat. So um I would maybe go do that, learn some of that, and then come back. Sometimes we just need to take a break because we've been learning for so long in tech, we just need to do something else. So I would say there's nothing wrong with feeling like you're, you know, you, you're you're bored with it or it's not interesting. Also, if a tool is not interesting, that's probably because you don't have a real world use case. So what I often recommend to people is if they're in if they're in a job, and I know that you're currently looking for a job, I would go and look at a job that you really want, okay? Like a job that you wanna apply for and look at what they expect. And that maybe that'll provide some motivation because you're like, oh, that company wants these specific things. I really wanna work at that company, so I will learn these things. Maybe it's not Docker and Kubernetes in this moment. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's Terraform. Maybe it's getting an actual DevOps certification that doesn't require you to know a tool, right? There is the DevOps Institute. So go check out DevOps Institute certifications. Um, those are more on the fundamental side of things rather than learning a tool. So maybe you want to learn some ideas. Also, if you're interested in certain parts of tech, like maybe you're interested in Androids 
in Android development, or maybe you're le- interested in Raspberry Pis and little small machines like that. Whatever you're inherently interested in, take the tools and apply it to that. So if you're interested in gaming, learn how to run a Minecraft server in Docker. Learn, then learn how to run Minecraft in Kubernetes. Um, there's lots of tutorials on Minecraft. So I try to find ways of using the tools that I need to learn for the things I care about. If I have a website, even though you don't need to run a website in Kubernetes, go run your website in Kubernetes. That'll teach you how to make sure it's always available, to make sure you can do updates without downtime, right? Run your own blog in Docker and in Kubernetes maybe. And I think that that's easier for us to learn, right? If we're inherently interested because of some other goal, I think that's better. And that's a great conversation, a great question, Jeff. I'm saying Jeff, hopefully that's close to the pronunciation. Not sure how hard that Z is. Um, thanks, Zephyr. Thanks so much. I'm glad you enjoy the courses. Um, Pavan, I ans- answered that question already. The, the, the default working directory is none, is the root. Uh, it all depends, though, on the image you're using. If you're using from Python, I don't actually know what the default directory is when you exec in, but the easiest way to find out is just to download an image, run it, and exec into it with a bash, and then see what directory you're in. If, you're, if that's the directory you're in, that's where the work there is set, right? And my SQL server might be different because it has a different work there than another one. Um, do I recommend console? I don't use console. Uh, I know people that love it, use it all day for everything, um, but I don't use it. So I don't have an opinion around console. Um, if you don't, don't go looking for places to use it. You'll know you need it when you need something for your architecture or your application itself, and you need to store stuff, and it looks like console can solve your problem. We're actually going to have, hopefully, a console show. I'm working now on getting people on the show to talk all about console. So keep coming back. We're going we're gonna to do that this year, I hope. Uh, Alexander is back with another doozy of a question. If you apply CPU limits in Docker containers, do the CPU limits behavior, are they transparent with C groups on the host OS? For example, CPU throttling applied to container process, same as host process. Um, As far as I know, when Docker itself isn't limiting the CPUs or any of the other resources, it's using C groups for all that functionality. So... If you're doing C group stuff for other things outside of Docker, then this will this should work together, right? These these things are uh, the, the two biggest features that make Docker possible are namespaces and C groups, and those are Linux kernel based functionalities, right? Those are um, part of the API of the kernel. So um, I would say yes, it's going to work fine. Marco says he looks through the Kubernetes or the Docker course, I assume, one of the Unimi courses. I have four uh, and more are coming. So thank you and good luck. By the way, uh, there's a link below. Get the coupons so you can save some money on the courses. Um, link below in the description of this video. All right. Um, we've been going now for almost 90 minutes. So I'm going to give us five more minutes to ask a question. So throw your questions in there and. Um, We'll get those answered. Um, Abdul has a question about the courses. Um, you're saying, I need some clarification. By the way, thank you for taking my courses and buying them. Um, but I need some clarification about volume drivers, specifically storage OS and others that work with it. Okay, what's your question? <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't see a question there. Abdul, ask me a question and I'm happy to answer. Yeah, Biker's pointing out um, that you can override the default directory in any image with a work dir. You can even override that work dir with a Docker run command or with an exec command. Any of those ways you can override it. Great point. Thank you, Biker. Um, Dr. Eagle. 
is there a way to add SSL for every container in the same server? Yes, that is known typically as a ingress proxy. So if we're talking about Kubernetes here, then you could use the, the Nginx, one of the default uh, ingress providers. You could, you could run traffic, which is one of my favorites. There's Envoy and Contour together. Um, and all those, those tools all provide a method for you to use Let's Encrypt. And Let's Encrypt would be the easiest way to add SSL certificates that are, you know, because SSL implies you're using DNS, right? You usually don't want to make an SSL certificate for an IP address. You usually want to make it for a DNS name. And so all those tools provide ways documented in their documentation for automatically using Let's Encrypt for new services that you add an ingress for and you enable SSL for that ingress rule. So go check all that stuff out. If you're using Docker and Swarm only, Traffic has that as well. You can use Traffic with Swarm or Traffic with Docker and Traffic has Let's Encrypt built in. Let's Encrypt is great because it's free. Uh, it's run by a nonprofit, so it's well-trusted. Many large organizations use it. Um, and they have served so many, I don't even know if they're to a billion certi certi certificates at this point, but uh, SSL cert certificates are like, you shouldn't have to manually upload certificates anymore in most cases, unless you have some sort of mutual authentication requirements. Really nowadays, everyone's assuming that your server has some way of getting to the internet. It can use Let's Encrypt. All right. All right, we got a few minutes left. I'm going to wrap up as much as I can here and get all these questions done. You need to know how to use it, Abdul. You need to know how to use storage OS. Um, I have never personally used storage OS, so I'm not gonna be able to help you with that specifically. Um, when you're in Kubernetes, you know we talked earlier about the landscape. So if you go to landscape.cncf.io and you look under the storage category, you can find tons of tools out there. There's Ceph, there's Rook, there's um, storage OS, there's um, ranchers. What is ranchers called? Um, Longhorn. Longhorn is another. And they all have different ways to configure them. There's different requirements. So you need to understand your application's requirements first. So when it comes to storage, step one is you got to know what your app needs. And your app may need storage that is fast, maybe it can be a little slow, maybe it's object storage, maybe it's file storage, maybe it's storage that has to be connected to multiple pods at once, which is called read, write, mini, and that's a different type of storage. And so once you understand those real needs of your applications, then you can go hunting for a storage provider, whether that's in your data center or in the cloud, that meets those needs. And there are dozens of them, and every team I work with uses something different. They use a different setup. So it might be very simple. If you're in a cloud, you don't need Read Write Mini because hopefully you don't. I've, I find Read Write Mini in most cases to be a design flaw of your application. Um, that's usually legacy applications where they all need to pass files around between parts of the app on the, on the hard drive. And in Kubernetes, that's not easy to do because now you have multiple nodes and the nodes don't share a file system. So in those cases, you usually need to connect read, write, mini in AWS that is called EFS. In if you're not using AWS or use something else where they don't have a read, write, mini, or it's, it's abbreviated RWX. So if you look for RWX storage, that is one of those harder requirements. Um, if you, for example, need storage to replicate between nodes, that's a different type of storage. Longhorn can do that. Ceph can do that. Rook can do that with Ceph. Um, Min Minio can do that. And so there's different tools for different jobs. And I can't shortcut that for you, unfortunately, today. But hopefully that helps answer some of your questions. Maybe? Okay. Do, we, do you think we should run separate databases from Kubernetes and run it in standalone server? Um, well, for, okay, for anything persistent storage, databases, whatever, I always use the clouds. If you're in the cloud with the app, use the clouds databases. They're going to be better at it than you. I'm sorry to say they're going to be better. I know it's more expensive, but do you really have all the free time? You're expensive. 
all of you are expensive <laughs> to the company. So it's almost always cheaper. And, I, and I've done this analysis before. It is almost always, and in, in every case I've done this analysis, it's cheaper to use the storage, for the, the, the database in the cloud than it is to run it yourself in production. Now, if you're doing testing, you can spin up containers all day long uh, with running MySQL, Postgres, Elasticsearch, Redis, whatever. Um, if So that's my answer typically, is you should be using the cloud if you're in the cloud. If you are not able to do that for a myriad of reasons, you're in a data center, you're on the edge, um, you're in a cloud that doesn't have its own database servers, which is probably a weird cloud <laughs> at this point, then yes, use databases in Kubernetes. Um, if you know how to run Kubernetes, if you understand how to troubleshoot the basics of Kubernetes, you know how to maintain it, run it, keep it secure, and you want to run databases in it, great, because databases are already hard. So you put them on their own servers, that's hard. Putting them in Kubernetes, a little harder, because now it means you have to know the databases and you have to know Kubernetes. But if you know those two things, there's nothing wrong with running it in Kubernetes. Plenty of databases are run in Kubernetes. They're just run by people that know what they're doing. And so a lot of times I'll find people that they know run, they know they know how to run a Postgres container, but do they know how to properly monitor it, back it up, make it fail over and fault tolerant? Um, you know, doing snapshotting and memory caching and performance tuning. Do you know how to do all those things as well as the cloud? Um, a lot of us don't. Um, if you do, then you're a database admin and you should do your own databases. Um, Another question, after learning Linux, networking, and concepts of the cloud, what to learn next? Well, it just kind of depends on your job. So if you're talking about DevOps, learn learn the fundamentals of DevOps, then learn DevOps tooling, and then, you know, whatever job you're looking to get, learn what they want, because every job is different, right? Every programmer job is different. So you're going to want to focus on the things for the jobs you're looking for. Um, and that's the thing. There's so many jobs out there that if you know these five things, there is a DevOps job for you probably out there. You just have to go finding, find it and focus on the jobs with the, that have the requirements that you have expertise in. So if you go get your certifications on AWS, don't go applying for jobs that have Azure requirements, <laughs> right? So that's, that's kind of, it. earlier on, um, we had many talks around learning DevOps. So go to brett.show slash DevOps. There's a whole list there. Five common Docker file mistakes. Um, bloated images that have a lot of security vulnerabilities using the default upstream images instead of slim. Running as root when you should not run as root. Um, not having health checks and the health check command in your Docker file. And what's the last one? Um, shipping developer dependencies into production when you don't need those in production. So I always focus on slim images, slim base images, making sure it passes security scans like Sneak or Trivi. The great, great question. <laughs> I just got a new follower. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, having vo issues on how to use volume mapping in Swarm uh, unfortunately, that's not so something I can help you troubleshoot here. Um, over here is our Discord server where you can ask in the Docker channel um, about Swarm volume stuff. So I would recommend you jump in there. Do I have a course on LinkedIn Learning? I do not, but I do recommend the DevOps Fundamentals course on LinkedIn Learning. Everyone should be taking that one. That's a good one. Um, it's called DevOps Fundamentals. I am only on Udemy. And they treat me right. So I, I like you to me. I stick with them. Um, okay. Okay. We are past time. So I'm going to pick two or three more questions here. Um, there are differences in the version of Kubernetes. So yes, every version of Kubernetes has a few minor differences. Um, the, over time, they break less and less. <laughs> um, the creation of pods. So you're, I think what you're talking about is in my courses today, my courses were designed on 117, which was only three years ago, not even, not even three years ago. And in 118, 
the cube control run command changed to run a pod, not a deployment. That's the only, that was the one major change of 118. So quite honestly, cube control run, run it, making a pod, just like Docker run makes a container. It makes sense to me. I'm glad they made that change, but it did change the one or two videos in the courses. If you're going to use cube control, create deployment, that's the new way to create a deployment in Kubernetes from the command line. The reality though, is once you've learned those commands, you won't use them that much because everything in the real world is with YAML. We do things in YAML and we cube control apply. So I wouldn't fret too much about those two commands being different now. Everything else is gonna work, right? All the, the, those videos are due to be replaced and will be replaced. Um, but other things, for example, the ingress providers have all been updated in the courses. So those, those are coming up after you learn those. So it's not like everything in the course doesn't work. It's just every once in a while a feature changes and I'm constantly changing videos. So I just do things in the order of priority, whether it's really broken or just kind of broken. Um, for example, I think we just, just updated something this week in Docker mastery that, um, was a broken, I think it was a broken image on Apple M1 servers. So I, I fixed that so that our Apple M1 devices and ARM servers weren't able to do some, one of the things in Docker mastery. So I fixed that. Um, so those are coming up. Those updates are coming, but I, um, I, I would keep going. Like you're not going to hit a whole lot of roadblocks just because you're on, you know, 123 or 124. <laughs> How do you convince banks to use already maintained cloud? Um, I don't know. Lots of banks use the cloud. Lots of banks use Kubernetes. I'm not sure if your ba if your bank's not doing it. I'm not sure how to help you. <laughs> um, we're in the latter. Are we with Docker now? Figuring out Docker is still worthy. Um, yes, you have to learn Docker. Like Docker is fundamental to container learning. Um, none of the other container runtimes are designed, like if you avoid Docker, you're eventually just going to have to deal with it. And you're going to have to use other tools in ways that aren't as consistent with Docker. So like there's Podman, there's Container D, but those tools don't meet, they don't do everything, right? So you can't just learn one tool and then skip the rest of them and think you're going to be fine. So you're going to have to learn Docker. Kubernetes does not run containers. Kubernetes tells a container runtime to run containers. So you have to learn the runtimes and Docker is still a runtime. Even today, Docker shim is gone, but has been replaced with a new Docker shim and people still run Docker and Kubernetes. Container D comes from the Docker project. Container D is run by Docker. So by learning Docker, you can actually learn container D because it's a subset. By the way, when you run Docker run, it runs container D. Container D is the replacement for Docker in Kubernetes in a lot of distributions. So when you're local on your machine, the, the best experience, in my opinion, to run a container is with Docker Desktop. It means you got to learn Docker. Um, there's other tools out there. There's Rancher Desktop. There's, there's Podman. There's you know many other tools, but none of them, and I have a spreadsheet to prove this, none of them are as feature complete as Docker Desktop. And when you're taking my courses, you are given a license to Docker desktop. Um, even if you're in a company that uses Docker in production or whatever, uh, you can use Docker desktop for free in my courses. I have had a personal guarantee from Docker upper management that their intention with their license is that Docker desktop and all the other Docker services are free for learning. So as long as you're learning in my courses, you can use those tools and you're legally allowed to do so. So I would absolutely recommend Docker Mastery to you, especially if you're getting started, because when you get to Kubernetes, it assumes that you know how to build and run containers. And you could avoid the Docker tool itself, but then you're learning Podman or ContainerD or something else that isn't as popular for running containers locally. And you're in some job, you're going to have to end up running Docker. And if you don't know it, it's going to be kind of weird, I think. All right. Thanks, Zef. Zef with a Z. Um, you're welcome. That's why I'm here to answer the questions. 
Would I recommend a setup to local K, K8's cluster on macOS? Um, I want to integrate with some load balancer closer to how it's done in cloud. Um, well, it, I don't know. When you say integrate with some load balancer, um, I mean, Docker Desktop comes with a load balancer type built out of the box. Like it comes, so you can actually make a load balancer uh, Kubernetes manifest in your service and it will work in Docker Desktop. Rancher Desktop is probably the second best way to run Kubernetes locally. There's also K3D. There is um, just using multi-pass and setting up micro -cates. You know, there's mini cube. I mean, there's just so many different ways. It really depends on you, your workflow. Um, I have a spreadsheet on all these tools for running Docker. It's meant on focus on running Docker locally. But at this point, we assume that when you're running Docker, you also want to run Kubernetes. So I have this spreadsheet that I will bring up. And I will put this in chat. So this is, no, I call this the Docker desktop alternatives, but it's really just about all the different tools locally for running containers. If it runs a container, it should hopefully be on this list, but it's meant for day-to-day -day use. And there's all sorts of features. Some of them are Kubernetes. Some of them, you know, are just Docker. Some of them are just Kubernetes. Some of them do both. And so go check that out. I try to keep it up to date. I've also, uh, if you know something about any of these tools that I have missed, feel free to add comments because I've opened up comments to everyone. And then if, if I validate that comment and find that it's true, then I'll add a thumbs up, a thumbs down, whatever. Um, but you can kind of see over here in this column, the, the total functionality of tools and, you know, check it out. Hopefully that helps. Hey, I'm glad you bought the course on Udemy. Thank you so much. Um, apply linting on Docker using Hadoo lint. Absolutely. <laughs> um, sorry, I skipped some questions. Uh, good open source communities on in DevOps. Um, DevOps.fan, 10,000 people all doing and using DevOps daily. Um, there's lots of other DevOps communities out there. It just really is pick your platform. Um, you can find a community on Twitter. You can find a community on Reddit. Uh, you know, just about every platform for communities has those, right? There's multiple DevOps communities on D Discord, which is where mine's at. Right there. How to take Docker container dynamically in Kubernetes. Sorry, I don't know what that means dynamically. So you're gonna have to explain more. I don't have a Helm course recommendation. Sorry, Ariel. What minimum DevOps should I learn to contribute to open source? Um, there is no requirement. Um, Rohit, if you're, to contribute to open source doesn't mean you need to run source code. Contributing to open source just means helping others. So if you're answering questions on Stack Overflow, you're technically in open, in the open there, and you're contributing. Uh, going into GitHub on one of your favorite tools, go into GitHub, go in the, in the issues, and try to help people solve issues. It's one of the most fundamental, easiest things to do, requires zero coding, and you're contributing. You're contributing just as much as a maintainer by doing that. It's not a lesser job. It's just as important. That's why most of my focus is on teaching others in the community. I have friends who spend all their time in Stack Overflow answering questions. Shout out to Brandon Mitchell. Uh, so you can choose how you want to contribute to, to open source. It doesn't have to be in source code. You could, you could be someone who's all about good documentation and you go and find problems in the documentation and just the daily use of the tool and you realize there's a mistake there or it's confusing so you want to improve the documentation. And then a lot of those, open, those documentations have an open source repo where you can just give a pull request to that project for documentation. That's vitally important for other people to use the tool and to make the tool more popular. So I think that those are underrated skills. So the only requirement for any of that is to learn the tool like 
Stack Overflow. If you want to help answer questions on Stack Overflow, you got to learn how to use Stack Overflow. If you want to learn how to help on GitHub with GitHub issues or GitHub documentation, then you've got to learn GitHub and GitHub pull requests. So definitely go learn GitHub and then just start using tools when you're learning them or in your job or whatever, and then go, go into the issues and start helping out. Someone who hangs out in issues long enough in GitHub and starts helping others will be noticed by the maintainers. And they love your support. I love it when people go into my GitHub and tell me there's a problem or provide a fix or an enhancement. That's one of the best ways, I think. And it doesn't require coding. All right. Let's see. Uh, is it DevOps Foundations or DevOps Fundamentals? Let me look. Let me look. Let me look. That's a good question, Raymond. It's this one. Um, I'm going to go find the link. It's DevOps Foundations. That is it. Co I'm going to copy the link, put it in chat. This is so far what I've seen when it comes to learning the fundamentals, not the not the tools, but the fundamentals of what it means to have a DevOps DevOps mindset and to practice DevOps. These are concepts. These are processes. These are the why of DevOps, and that's a great course. Does Nginx have a better performance than Envoy? I don't know. Um, I know tons of teams that use Envoy. I know tons of teams that use Nginx. So I it, I think it all depends. I mean, it would have to be a very specific little test that you would have to do. I don't think in general, one is necessarily faster than the other. They're both very lean, very focused tools that um, that I think either one would meet your needs, I guess, at this point. But you're going to use Envoy with something else. And most people use Contour if they're going to use Envoy. There's other ways to use Envoy, but I know and support Contour. So, um, Blade Killer is Docker Master getting into explaining containers from scratch. So, I'm not sure if you mean like a scratch image. Then no. No, I don't go that deep into starting from an empty image because. Quite frankly, very few people ever do that. Unless you're shipping a static binary, which is easy then, right? If you're using Golang or Rust or C, and if you're using any of these things where you build a static binary, statically compiled binary, it's a single file, then that's easy. You just start from scratch, copy one file in, and you're done. <laughs> and I don't teach that in the course because most people are not yet using those languages when they take my courses. They're much more likely to be using something like Java or Node.js, or Python, or Ruby, or PHP, or .NET, or some, something where there's going to be lots of files and they're going to need a base operating system inside, at least not necessarily the operating system, but like the operating system fundamentals, like a, a shell, you know, SSL certificates, a package manager, they need that stuff. So I don't, I teach that stuff, but I don't teach from scratch yet because it doesn't, people haven't asked for it. So thank you for asking. I will definitely consider that for future videos. I basically go with what people ask more for. And right now, what people are asking for is more advanced Docker file setup. So we're building content for that. And you can actually find that inside the repo. We've actually got pull requests of new content coming soon. What's my favorite food? Um, my favorite food is meat. How about that? Meat and bourbon. Is bourbon a food? I think bourbon's a food. All right, I'm gonna have to wrap this up. Thank you so much for all the questions. Let me see if we can get one or two more questions from people that haven't had a question answered. Um, the difference between Kubernetes and OpenShift, by the way, is there isn't any. OpenShift is Kubernetes. OpenShift is just a distribution of Kubernetes. Kubernetes has 80 to 100 distributions. Rancher, Tanzu, all these different distributions. And OpenShift is just one of them. So it has certain defaults. It comes with certain extra tools. Um, that's all. Uh, is Pivotal Cloud Foundry a replacement for Kubernetes infrastructure? No, Blade Killer. I would say that Kubernetes is a replacement for Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Pivotal, Pivotal was around, the Cloud Foundry was before we had Kubernetes and containers, and then it kind of shifted to support 
more of that ecosystem, but I don't I don't actually know anyone that uses Cloud Foundry anymore. I'm I'm sure there's people that do, but I don't see a lot of jobs for it and, you know, people learning it. So, um I would recommend Kubernetes all the way. Uh, when a container fails, a liveness probe, does Kubernetes restart all the other containers in the same pause or only restart that one it failed? Just the one. Just the one. Uh, we already answered that question. Uh, how how in-depth in the networking concepts such as CCNA topics does a, develop, a DevOps person need to go? It just depends on where you're going to focus. Because again, DevOps is lots of different jobs. But CC, getting a CCNA will really help you in your career. In fact, getting a networking plus or and a CCNA is one of the best things I think in, in any career in tech you could do. Learning the basics of an OS, the basics of security, of just general network, OS security, and then learning networking are three fundamental concepts that you could never have too much of in any engineering job. I don't care what the job is. I went and got my CCNA in the 90s and it has served me ever since. I lean back on those fundamental skills of IP, TCP, UDP, routing, switching. Those things really help me understand packets, how to troubleshoot networks and ethernets, the ethernet um, connections, all those things, right? It's just, it's fundamental to how everything works nowadays. So I think it's key and I would absolutely recommend it. Do you have to have that certification to get started in DevOps? No, but it will serve you well to know more and more networking. Um, so thank you all for the continued questions. Unfortunately, I have run out of time today and I'm 20 minutes over. So I'm gonna say, come back next week. We've got show, I'm here every Thursday, same time between shows. Go over to the DevOps Discord server. 10,000 people in there. We got tons of channels, people talking every day, answering questions. Great. It's a great community. I'm very proud to be a part of that. And um, next week, by the way, we're going to have Argo CD on the show. So come back next Thursday. We're going to demo and talk all about Argo CD um, with some of the people from the Argo company, Acuity. And then uh, after that, pretty coming up soon, we're going to have Nermal from AWS on, my friend Normal, you've seen him on the show before. Normal Meta is gonna be here talking about Carpenter, a way, Carpenter with a K. It's a way that, AWS, it's a new open source tool that AWS released that's going to help you scale, auto scale your infrastructure in Kubernetes using easier tooling. So those are all coming up and we've got more shows coming all summer long. So come back every Thursday, we'll be here. If you didn't know, sign up on my Patreon to get all the announcements about this channel. So obviously like and subscribe, but if you didn't know, if you go over to Patreon, links below, you can sign up for free, just click the join button or the follow button. And that button, the follow button gives you my weekly email of what's gonna be on the show, what new open source I'm releasing, the podcast episodes that are coming out, all that stuff. If you'd like to buy me a coffee, you can always click join there and you get some benefits for doing so. Um, but you don't have to, you can just click the follow if you just want to get the, the once a week email updates. And with that, I will bid you adieu. See you all next week. Ciao.